go back to value food, uh, speaker and slides and ammunition. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So my name is Leonard. I'm a product manager here in GovTech. But uh, this presentation is more about this. So let's talk more about Form SG and what it is. All right. So Form SG, what are we? We're basically like a Google Forms for government. And our tagline is the ability to give agencies uh, the power to build government forms in minutes. So when we first came out of this, um, it was actually a bit ironic for some of the users because when you, when you think of government in, in minutes, it sounds odd. Um, normally you don't think build government forms in minutes, you might think of like more order of magnitude months maybe. But we, we managed to do it and let me first dive into what was the problem that we're trying to solve in this blue screen. Paper forms. Today in government, we are still using a lot of paper forms. I'm not sure if any of you have filled in a paper form from government in the past year. Maybe some of you might have. Okay, so that should be on Form SG, if it's not already. So when we ask agencies, how many paper forms are there? Uh, what is the size of the problem that we're looking at? Uh, we got all kinds of answers, but we decided to search for an answer on our own. So we went to Google, our friend, um, and we tried to estimate the number of paper forms on government websites. So we just did a search for form within government sites and of file type PDF, because PDF files, the I mean, PDF forms aren't actually digital forms, they're just paper forms converted to PDF. And we saw 60,000, pretty large number. Some of you guys might argue that this number is obviously inflated, because you know, out of these 60,000, how many of these are actually forms? Maybe the query form is not that accurate, but it's a rough order of magnitude tens of thousands, even if you divide this by ten, it's still thousands of paper forms on government sites. It's still a big problem. And if you were to imagine, if all of these were to be digitized without Form SG, that would be a nightmare. Because imagine if this form, let's say it's an IRAS form, without a self-service form builder tool, the agency will have to contact uh, an external developer to digitize it. It will cost engineers digitized forms. That's pretty expensive and really slow. Which is why we built a form builder tool uh, in order to digitize all of these forms. There's thousands of forms. And that's Form SG. Alright, so how does Form SG actually work? It works in a slightly different way compared to Google or all the form builder tools out there. Four steps. So the first step, you know in government we have both internet and intranet. Internet is what everyone in the world uses. Intranet is our own secure intranet. In, an internal internet. All right, so, but for Form SG, you can build your form on the internet at form.gov.sg. We took extra effort to make this mobile optimized um, because in government, most agencies do not have an internet enabled laptop. Uh, our, you know, in government, there's the internet section. Uh, most users can only access the intranet. But, but, but we're not winning the hosting on the internet because the internet is quite expensive. So if hosting on the internet, we better make it mobile optimized because they'll be building their forms on their phone. So we did. So the first step, you build a form on the internet. The second step, you share the form with a link and the citizen can fill in this form. We've been integrated with government authentication. Some of you might have filled in uh, SingPass before, my info, CodePass, you might have heard of all these things. We actually integrate with them, which means that it's easy to enable such government authentication with a click of a button on your form. And the third part is the interesting part. So we don't store form responses. That's how we're different from all the other form builder tools out there. So for every response, you get an email. Which means that our server doesn't store any data at all. So we're completely lightweight. Um, it's, it's basically just like a collect and forward kind of model. You know, you can, you can build a beautiful form using our, our, our tool, but we won't host the data for you. We'll just email the responses to you. But of course, you get this nightmare where if you have a survey of like 30,000 people, you get like 30,000 emails, right? No one wants to receive that number of emails, which is why we have step four. We developed a compilation tool, uh, a hack, for you guys to aggregate the emails back into an Excel. I'll talk more about this later. So, we've been around for only like a, a bit of, above a year, but as of today, we've had quite a bit of usage. Um, there are 90 government agencies in Singapore, 84 of them are aware. They have at least one officer sign up. Many are and some are active, having created forms with thousands of submissions. 
But I'll say our penetration is about 20%. If you think of the really active users, not quite there yet. But the speed is picking up pace, right? So um, you, we're seeing this nice looking graph finally in terms of user signups. These users are government officers signing up, right? You can see in the last month alone, there are almost 900 officers that sign up in one month. So given this speed of growth, actually in another year, we'll be hitting 100% penetration, the whole government. But of course, towards the end, we expect a slowdown in the take up because of the laggards. But people are not just signing up, people are actually using FormSG to build forms to get a response because you can see the usage graph as well. In green, it's picking up month on month as well. You can see at the beginning, you know, we struggle to find this product market kind of fit. Um, I mean, just looking at signups alone, you can tell there's a market fit, that there's a problem worth solving. But if people download and, well not download, if people sign up and do not use that, it, it might not be the right product to solve it. So at the start, we're kind of struggling from that. Uh, you can see usage, it, it does increase, but it's, it's kind of flatlining. But in the past few months, we seem to have a bit of traction that's finally happening as usage. And there are about a few, like a thousand over forms of various types that are being used across government. Some of these are public facing. You can, you can find these forms on agency websites, such as you know, um, application, you know, the one in brown, uh, MOE, you know, this O-level music course application that's on Form SG. And even for research polls as well, such as LTA Transport Master Plan EPO, all these are done through Form SG. All right, so, and at the end of all our forms as well, we have this toilet smiley questions, you know, the five smiley faces. Turns out a lot, around 20% 20, 20 of people actually fill in this additional question. And 86% of the respondents are actually satisfied with filling in Form SG forms. All right, so all that, it's about where we are today. Um, it's been like, I guess, okay, fine, 15 months since the very, very, very beginning. Um, and that's where we are. Let's rewind back and talk a bit about the journey and some of the, I guess, product issues and product thinking that went uh, into designing this. All right, so this is where we are, but actually it did, really didn't start out that way. So it started more like this. So we actually didn't start off with a form builder tool. It started off with me manually building HTML forms for our users. And then the citizen will fill in your ugly form. I'm, I'm not a UX designer. I, I, I try to be um, knowledgeable. I about what you designed, but I, I'm obviously not an aesthetic person. The responses still go to your Outlook. That was there from the beginning. But we also had to spend 10 hours setting up this macro. The earliest version was some macro written in VBA to aggregate responses from email into Excel. And it, what's even worse is that it was basically this like, of code they have to pass around to agency officers. And you know, agency officers, are, well, many of them are not the most tech savvy, so I have to explain to them what is code and this is VBA, and you've got to change this line of code to put in your email and, and all those setup. You, you spend a long time sitting with them just to set it up. Right. But the whole point is that at the beginning, with something so ridiculous, we still had users. With some people that are willing to sit down with us to solve their pain point. Because without this, what they were doing is every single week, they have a stack of paper forms in front of them, and the poor dude have to manually digitize that into an Excel spreadsheet. So they were willing to sit down with us to, um, to, to talk about the solution with us at the beginning and spend that time because that will save them hours every single week from their workload. So at the beginning, we had our first two use cases from the municipal services office. They were for very obscure things. They were not for fancy MOM, MOE applications, large volume, no. It was for things that I don't know many of you guys might not think of pigeon inspections, right? We're tracking pigeon inspections. The poor officer was doing it to paper, right? That's horrible. So we decided to digitize them for house visits. The previous process for the officer to take down notes on paper, go back and manually fill it in. For pigeons, officer will email inspection observation HQ who will manually collate into Excel. A lot of manual work being done here. And why can't you use Google Forms? Actually, the first thing I, I told them was, hey, just use Google Forms for, forms for this. La. I mean, like, it's, it's, it's a lot of work to build a whole form tool on your own, right? And their reply at that time, that was three months ago, was classified sensitive data, right? So wait, I, I can't use Google Forms for this. And their proposal was really, hey, why don't you build a Google Forms for us? 
and you can host it on a, in a, some secure government data centers and, and how much does it cost? We'll pay you, right? Okay, they wanted to pay us, but um, being um, mindful uh, civil servants, I guess I would have called it, uh, we, we thought that there could be a better solution than just you know, implementing the whole thing ground up, hosting our expensive government data, data centers, right? So what I've really learned you know, at, at the beginning, sorry, in, in, in red right at the bottom, right? It's really to, it's, 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 not, it's not always a good idea to listen to your users for their solution. It, it, you have to talk to users, right, obviously. We talk to our users to understand their pain points and their problems. But sometimes when you ask a user for, let's say, you know, they're riding a horse, you can ask them, hey, um, what, so your problem is that you're not traveling fast enough. What is your proposed solution? They'll say, okay, I think we need a faster horse. You know, maybe feed the horse better food, whatever, right? But they would probably have thought of like a car, you know? So it's, it's, it's sometimes up to someone external to the problem to brainstorm a, a, a better solution to that problem. And this is what I learned so far. So the version zero was the email uh, method that we came up with. Um, and, and the main reason is to avoid hosting on expensive government servers. Uh, we are hosted on AWS. Um, that's more low cost. And, and it's, it's all the good stuff that comes along with it. You know, it's, it's pretty good reliability, availability, and etc. Um, and so for that, the very first version was really just each response sends one email to you. Right? So that, but that doesn't really solve the whole problem because the problem is still about manually filling it in. So how do we go from emails to the Excel? Right? That was the second challenge that we had to face, which is kind of like version 0 0.5, which you thought about, the VBA script that aggregates emails from Outlook into Excel. So that works. But of course, with VBA, it's a whole nightmare. Um, I, I wasn't well-versed in VBA. Uh, so so I, I, I mean, I, I pick it up as well. And I guess this is where I learned that um, sometimes it's okay to you know, even pick up the old if you find it useful um, to code out a quick solution, it might not be the best solution at the beginning. Of course, deploying a VBA script was a nightmare, but at least it helped solve that one user's problem. So maybe we can start from that and clean up later. That's what a user wanted. I even Skyped that user for two hours going back and forth on how to install the script. There's a lot of interesting problems here. So the script, um, I can distribute the script through an email. Right? It's not like, it's not like I, I, could, I could package it in some, inside some executable or something like that and push it down centrally. Um, the, the government system doesn't work that way. So I had to email the script over to them. And the user was so happy that they actually saw the response. This is a dummy response, by the way, in the Excel spreadsheet. This is an actual email. As you can see, the title is called VB Session from Hell. And the user said, this is what Triumph looks like. This is pure joy from solving a user, even though it's a very inefficient way to solve it at the beginning with this VBA script. So from there, the user actually asked, hey, this works. What if they want to change fields on the fly? I said, just call me, you know. <laughs> no problem. I can add in those extra fields for you on the HTML form, and well on HTML, just not VBA, right? But then I realized that's obviously stupid because more and more requests started coming in. Like, hey, I want this change. I want this field to add an extra S. You know, wordsmithing. Oh, I want the extra field. How about a new form? Oh, okay, I had enough of it. I decided to ask them to do the work to build a form builder tool. So, we borrowed two people, right? There was Abby and Nam. Sorry, I couldn't find a picture for Nam, my colleague. So, we borrowed this guy. Um, so, it's a the basic back-end engineer, front-end engineer to start building a form builder tool. And what did we do? We looked at open source tools out there. Of course, you wouldn't want to reinvent the wheel. Probably not trivial to build your own form builder tool. So we found a few. We found like jQuery form builder. Um, it's one of those. Although jQuery, as some of you guys know, might be a bit dated. So we didn't like this because we weren't designers, but it felt was ugly, as you can see. Form is looks better, right? And uh, there was also no user login implemented, uh, which is what we wanted in the early days. Uh, because obviously, you know, you, you create your forms, you want to maintain them yourselves. You need some kind of login. To, to prove that those forms belong to you, so you don't end up messing other people's forms. So, uh, my colleagues wanted me to use something else called Lime Survey. Actually, some of the words are at the bottom. But this is another alternative. We didn't use it as well. Um, it's written in PHP and um, no hate for PHP. I think parts of Facebook probably still use it, but I personally worked with it, don't really like it. 
It's also, it was also kind of ugly. Um, there was a free version um, that was open source, but then there was also like a, this paid version. Um, I, I think I wasn't a big fan of that because I would imagine that if I were a company offering like a premium version of something and I have a free paid version, I'll, if, if you put a business hat, you'd probably say, okay, maybe I'll put like some, some traps in the free version such that you will use the free version until a certain point and realize that your, your desires are not satisfied and you will pay. So I didn't want to fall into such a trap. So they didn't want this either. But the, but the, main, the main issue that we had was that there were actually millions of lines of code in this repository. There was a lot to navigate through and it was quite hard to find the piece of code they wanted to change in order to send emails over. Because all of these form builder tools, they all store data, right? So um, I, I, I don't remember what, I mean, I mean it's PHP, but I don't, I, I don't remember the, um, what was the actual backend um, database language that they use, C probably some kind of SQL, I'm not sure. Um, but we basically wanted to change that part of the code to instead of storing data and you know, using SQL, no SQL, whatever, we wanted to change that so that responses would be emailed over and that part of the code was so hard to find. We just couldn't find it. You had to change, probably change maybe 20% of the code in order to um, add in the functionality and that was millions of lines of code, 20%, hundreds of thousands of lines of code to code. No way. So we didn't stick to this. Finally, we found something. Uh, it's called Telforms. Uh, if you guys are aware, there's another popular form is a tool called Typeforms. Uh, I call it the beautiful Google Forms. Um, but Telforms is the open source version of Typeforms. Right, so we found that and loved it because it looks beautiful. It had user accounts done first. It was in JavaScript, right? So no PHP, yes. Mean stack, uh, Mongo, Express, Angular, Node.js. Angular 1, fine, but still at least Angular. And, and not vanilla JavaScript, for example. Although maybe some people out there do that. And, and the most beautiful thing is the point number four, because it, it basically took us a minute to find when the code we had to change to email responses over. Which means we can take this code and we just modify that part and we're good to go. So that was why we chose Telform. And at the same time, I knew that engineers that we borrow, you know, we only borrowed them for a limited time. It was this very hackish setup where we'll borrow them for another team for two weeks just to set this up. And after we set this up, um, we can move on and do something else. Right? It, it wasn't really like a real project at the beginning. Right? So I knew that time was limited, but this project had a lot more potential. Right? So we needed some permanent help, which is why we've got our good friend here, Asha, who sit, seated over there as well, to join the team. So at that point in time, Ashad just joined and I scammed him to join FormSG. Because what I learned is that at the very beginning, when you have no users yet, yet the litmus test is to convince capable people to join you. Because, I mean, if you can't convince someone to follow along with their vision, um, it's probably even harder to get users and their bosses to buy to their vision. So thankfully we have him. And uh, now that we have a team, we can do all the team stuff, right? all the cool stuff you can do at the beginning, like think of a name. Uh, at the start we thought of like Forma. Um, it was, it's basically like the Spanish translation of forms, I think. At least from Google Translate. But then I, I wanted to buy Forma.sg, but I realized that it was taken. I was so sad. But then I removed the A and realized that Form.sg wasn't taken. So obviously call it Form.sg. Can't believe Forma was taken but not Form. So yeah, we renamed because of that. And we created a logo, FormSG, that was the earliest logo. It was not done by a professional designer, it was done by one of us. If you realize it's actually like a, like a form, but tilted 45 degrees. I don't know if you all realize that, the FormSG. Yeah. We chose what I call developer colors, because all of us are developers. That shade of blue and that shade of green. It's not the Airbnb kind of colors, sorry. Where, where the beginning team did not really have designers in it. So we set up Pivotal, you know, it's, a, it's one of the task management tools, there are many, Trello, uh, Asana, etc, etc. We just use Pivotal because we're comfortable with it, to call it task. And there's, there, there isn't a lot of uh, uh, processes at the beginning. We, we, we deliberately kept it lightweight because we're a small team. It's just a GitHub repo, you know, you, you send a code review before PRS merge in the master, as simple as that. Some daily stand-ups at the beginning because we wanted to move fast. We, to get, we still wanted to keep the team in sync, so we had daily stand-ups. Um, Slack channel as well for communications and also a weekly sync up with our boss. That was all, right? So at the beginning, 
it was it was all about the product. It was all about solving the user's problem at the beginning. It wasn't about spending, I don't know, two months thinking of a team name, what's the best team name, what's, I don't know, the, the best domain we can buy, and uh, all, all those things at the beginning. It wasn't that. It was just about solving problems at the beginning. And I learned that at the start, we probably shouldn't spend too much time even developing um, full-blown Agile or Scrum, even at the beginning, especially if it's a small team. Because we, throughout, throughout the whole process of formation, the 15 months, we really carefully think about how much time we're spending on processes and how much time we're spending on the actual work. If we end up spending more time on processes than the actual work, then let's just drop those processes. Um, for a small team, we found this, these, these, well, everything on this, this list to be sufficient in terms of the, all the processes that we have to do. So we didn't really um, do a lot of those uh, things that you might do in, in Scrum, you know, maybe like all those retrospective, sprint planning, story pointing, all those things, we will go that deep into all these things. Okay, so we're excited, we've got a team, we solved the user's problem, we're going to get our forms deployed. We want it to be actually used, but it was hard. Because although the worker, you know, all the way at the bottom in pink, that we talked to liked it, obviously there are so, all these layers, you know, in, in red, purple and all that, that had to approve it first, before you can finally see it live. <sighs> How do we solve this? We dog fooded. We said, okay, you know, this external agency, agencies, whatever. Um, understandably, you know, it takes them time to get the, the, the series of approvals, especially for a prototype project. So we did it internal. Right? Maybe you could work for our team first. You know, make it, you can bring some uh, productivity gains to our team. So, you know, we had a colleague who was basically thinking of a checklist, uh, checklist kind of form before open sourcing. And we had another one, uh, another colleague called Liwei. Um, he was thinking of using forms for judging a data challenge event. So we asked them for help, and great things came out of them. Right? On the left, we discovered some bugs. You know, we also realized uh, a very critical feature that we missed out, the ability to allow new lines on your form. Can't believe we forgot about that. Um, and on the other hand, for the judging event, our then CEO at the time, Jacqueline, was the judge just happened that she was a judge. And the past year, she went to the same event and she filled a paper form. This time it's a digital form. She was elated about it. And she asked, where does this form come from? And we told her, this was created by one of your um, departments. And she was really excited, which is why she became our first, um, I guess, senior leader ambassador to actually help promote FormSG to other senior leaders. That's how we got a bit more traction, a bit of the buy-in from the top. And that was something that we obviously didn't expect at the beginning. You know, um, this whole dog fooding thing um, was, was something that we, did, that we didn't think would be such, such fruits of labor, I guess. Uh, but unexpectedly, it led us some users from the senior leadership level. And then we made a video because we think that, you know, from SG, if I, I have to go down and present to all these senior leaders, um, it, 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 it wouldn't be as impactful as if. I just made a video to share them to, to carefully explain how FormSG is. Because FormSG in the early days is quite complicated, right? So a video works. So I just got together, um, learned some um, iMovie and all that. I haven't made a video in my life before this. So I'll play the video. It's a bit ancient. It was done like 14 months ago. Um, and it's four minutes. Let's see if I can play it. Oh. video <laughs> the set music at the start because the current process is painful the music switches yeah the officer had to do manual data entry for all the responses This was the early UI.
This was sent to senior leaders, by the way. This was the VBA script. So they had to go into the code and change a few things and then press the tiny run button over there. And then you get the responses in Excel. Alright, so that was the early version of Form SG. That was the video, the marketing video that we made. Um, wasn't the most professional, but it did create a lot of buy-in. So senior leaders understood what the product was about um, through this video. And that is the result. We got a 10 times number of signups. Hooray! September 4, October 53. We're excited seeing this. I mean, today seeing this, it looks silly. But at that time, we were euphoric over this. And we started getting invited to present at various agencies. And now, we had a first world problem. We have a bit of attention, but we have all kinds of feature requests. We have people wanting to build all kinds of form fields. And how do we tackle that? Well, pretty simple. We just look at two, two dimensions, really. Intensity of problem and frequency of appearance across agencies, just like that. So th the ones in red are that's a pretty intense problems. So those are blockers for those agencies. So without those features, they will not deploy something on Form SG. So you can imagine like four agencies, A, B, C, D, right? And just by eyeballing it, we'll probably work on something like F1 because it's like red and all the agencies, well, A, B, C wants it. We'll work on F2 maybe because you know, it's, it's a blocker for agency C and really want um, them to use Form SG. Um, and F3 maybe, you know, F3, it's, it's maybe not, not a huge blocker, but it's a common enough uh, problem that occurs, so we might want to tackle that. But the point is that we have to walk away from something like agency D. Because we'll probably need a lot of engineering resource to code out for you know, features F9 to 12 just for agency D that are blockers, in order to convince them to use it. Why not focus a bit more on ABC, especially at the beginning? Which is the main thing that I learned at this stage, was that we had to learn to actively walk away from difficult customers at the beginning. Um, I mean, oftentimes you think about customer centricity, you know, it's all about satisfying the customer, but especially when you're lean and it's early, not every customer might be a perfect customer to begin with. There were a lot of big issues. Chief among them is this VBA script, right? Um, the agency, they had to sit down with those agency officers for two hours to 10 hours to figure out what's going on. So I rewrote it from an Outlook macro to an Excel macro. <laughs> Big improvement there. It's still in VBA, okay? But now there's UI, right? Now it's a script with a run button. It's basically an app, right, in Excel. So what users can fill in now is that they don't have to tweak code anymore. They just fill in different fields here, such as what is that form title and all those things. And they press run script and that will transform the emails into an Excel spreadsheet with those email responses collated, right? So this saved me a lot of time because I don't have to spend it two to 10 hours each time uh, telling them how to set this up. But I still have to accompany this with around a 10 page Microsoft Word document explaining to them how to install this. Because it's still not that straightforward to install. You could generate like a self-signing cert and all those things. And I, all these kinds of issues, right? I have to explain what script means. I right? have users saying, could I check out what script is? Is it a document file? Is it code? What is it? And agencies have to ask the IT department to whitelist um, our script for running. I guess because of security issues, you know, it's a macro after all. And script had to be emailed around. So it's challenging for us to centrally push updates. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine if you're like installing Uber app and then you have to email Uber, hey, can you send me the Uber app by email? Can it be sent our way? Just in case that got blocked and dropped, I wanted to check if you sent me the Uber app. Right? Imagine that. But we had to do that because, I mean, th there was no other simple way to, de to deploy our script. It had to be through email, which was painful. And whenever we had to make changes, we were thinking of like version control and all these things. Um, so we thought of a solution. Join one of these innovation challenges. Uh, bought, a, bought a server on the secure government data centers. They're talking at the beginning, just one server. And we coded a tool. So how this tool works, pretty interesting. Um, so the first step, 
So no more VBA. Okay, out of the VBA world, there are tools in JavaScript. Okay, so the first step is to export your emails to a .pst file. So on Outlook, um, you might archive emails on Outlook. I'm, actually, I'm not sure how many people here use Outlook. Maybe a lot use Gmail. I use Gmail more than Outlook. Um, but if you're on Outlook, you can archive emails, and the file extension of the archive file is something like maybe archive.pst. Right? So everyone's familiar with archiving emails, at least in the public service. So they receive all these emails. They can receive the form G email responses. The first step is to archive them to .pst. Second step is to visit this link on the government intranet and then you can dump the PST file there and we have this parser that passes the .pst file extension to a .xls, an Excel file. It's basically a parser that we, actually we didn't write it ourselves, we found it online as well, open source. I have no idea why someone wanted to pass .pst to .xls but I can find all the sort of interesting things open source online, passing from one file format to another. So we found it. How to pass something from .pst to .xls. And we implemented it, we made some tweaks, and this became our new way to collate email responses into Excel. And people started using this even more. Because what we realized before this was that the script was so hard to set up that people just didn't collate the emails. In fact, they bought email inboxes of larger and larger size to store all the email responses and worked off the emails. They didn't, they didn't rely on Excel. But after this, we realized that people are actually aggregating and uh, using this feature. All right, so, and then through the months, you know, um, after using that framework that we talked about, you know, intensity and, and, and frequency agencies, we implemented many features, right, such as ability to collaborate on forms, auto acknowledgement email, you know, when you finish your form, you automatically re receive a confirmation email that can be customized by the agency. Various types of fields, you know, attachment fields where you can upload a picture to, to send over as an email attachment, checkbox video button, other fields, even some kind of logic on your form where you can um, edit one field which decides whether to show another field or not. You know? And even with all these features, we still have pretty stagnant growth in terms of both signups and usage, as you can see from this graph, especially the signups graph. I think for a good, for the first six months really, we jumped from September to October and I was really happy about that 10 times growth. But obviously, um, for the next few months, there was dismal growth. People are signing up, right? It's just not signing up at a faster pace, right? So, what happened? We needed something better. We had two designers join our team as well. We wanted to build a better user experience. And we talked to users even more, right? When I mean talk to users, we talk to end users, we talk to citizens, the people filling in the forms. We wanted to build beautiful forms. It wasn't just government forms that can collect classified data, but beautiful forms. How do you do that? Well, actually at the back on this floor, we have an eye tracker kind of room. Uh, we basically invite the user down for our usability study. Uh, the user had to fill in a form SG form, uh, and, and there are these cameras that actually track where the user's eyes are looking at. So we invited all kinds of users, right? We invited the young and tech savvy. We in even invited uh, someone who's in the 60s as well, who has just taken one computer class. And even she can fill in a form G form, actually. And also, at the end of all our forms, we added in that, you know, that feedback um, to try to gather uh, how, how people feel about our forms. And we even got some feature suggestions from there as well. And we found some interesting things. Actually, I, I, I'd like to share a bit about some of the things that we found that were actually not so necessary. So there were these four things. There were many others, but I'll just like to share these four. Progress tracker. You know, on, on some forms you see, oh, zero or four answered, you know. Or sometimes it might be a percentage, 20% of the form done. We realized that people were actually not staring at that part of the screen. When we use eye trackers, you know, we can see that, you know, eye trackers, they, they'll put a heat map of where people are staring at. And we realized that people are not staring at there. So how are they measuring the progress to a form? found something interesting. People were staring at this. Yeah, you're right. So it's the height of the scroll bar and where it is relative to the screen. So if all, all the way at the bottom, people are almost done, right? And if the scroll bar is really thin, it means it's a really long form. So people are paying a lot of attention to that, which means that actually we can remove the progress tracker. And then there were these multiple pages forms, you know. Sometimes we had a form with like 100 questions. And then agencies will come to us and say, hey, you know, we have 100 questions. 
we need to separate our form into like five pages, right? We have to do that. That's like the best web design standards, right? So we actually thought about this, experimented a bit, talked to users. We actually realized that end users aren't the most satisfied in multiple pages. Because number one, I mean, based on the previous feature they decided to remove, with multiple pages, you can't really track progress through the scroll bar because you can't see the scroll bar of future pages. And secondly, people are just, most of our users fill in the forms on their phone. And on the phone, it's more optimized to scroll through things. Imagine if you are using Facebook and you go to click on some next button in order to view the story of the next person, the feed of the next person. It's pretty annoying. People are used to scrolling on their mobile phones, which is why we say no multiple pages, mobile first. We'll put all your questions on one page and you can hit us to separate them and users will scroll. Then there's this other back to top button, right? You might think it's a good idea. Some websites have it. What we realize is that back to top button actually causes users to skip questions because they think they can go back easily. You can imagine someone filling the form like this. See, fill in question three and then go and keep going on. Which questions are easy to fill in? I can always go back to top. There's that, that innate. Um, how do I put it? Innate desire, I guess, to, to not fill in the hard to fill in questions first because it's an easy way to go back. So, actually, by removing this, we realize that this actually saves user frustration at the end because they start filling in questions sequentially. And we even added in an like, error message that appears along the way to, to prompt them to fill in the questions as they go, not leave it to the end. Um, this actually say, makes, makes the user's life a lot better. Imagine filling in a whole form and because it's back to top button, because they don't warn you, they haven't filled in questions. And all the way at the end, it tells you six questions not filled in. That would be quite frustrating for quite a few users. And save as draft as well, right? So everyone thinks save as draft is a great idea. But we realize that this makes users dive into your form when you have a one minute toilet break. Horrible. So the simple fix to this, to prevent users from diving into a form without having the prerequisite materials available and, the, and, the, and enough time to fill in the form, is really mandating this. Mandating agency officers to put this on their form. Estimated time to complete. Could be five minutes, could be 30 minutes. But this, along with also a section on instructions, you know, prerequisites they need to fill in their form, made users um, set aside that amount of time so that they can fill it in in one sitting. That's a much better solution than coding a safe draft functionality. All right. And along the way, we also removed passwords. So earlier I was talking that we had this user login system, right? We realized that actually managing our own user login system is not that straightforward. Logins are everywhere. You might think they are quite non-trivial to implement, but not necessary. Um, you know, with logins, there are a lot of things to think about. There's like forget password, there's change password, there's when you first sign up, there's this verify link they generate. There are a lot of things to consider. It's quite a lot of code complexity. So we removed it. What we did was email OTPs. Because forms are one of these things where we hope a user doesn't log in every day, actually. Um, it's probably you log in once and maybe three months later you create another form, then you log in again. So people are not going to remember their passwords, which is why we have temporary passwords. They are sent into their government email accounts. And this means goodbye lines of complicated code and has a security side benefit as well because now our form builder is linked to the secure government email server. To log in, you're going to get the email OTP from your secure government email. We also redesigned our whole user interface. You know, in the video you saw that it was there, now it's this for our home page. New logo, by the way, as well. Looks a bit like, okay, fine. Flipboard, um, maybe a couple other companies. Uh, but it's, it's more design, designer type, not those uh, developer colors. So, all oh, build your form tab, uh, very developer kind of style. You can see even the buttons over here and all these icons. I think they're from um, an icon site that developers often use. I can't remember what it was called. I, I wiped it from my memory. My designers are happy I did that. So, sorry? Fabicon. Yes, Fabicon. Glyphicon, Glyphicon, yes. Glyphicon and Fabicon, yeah. Those are the, the developer ones, right? The designer ones are, I think, box icons. Pretty good icons over there. 
Yeah, like the plus over there, see? You see the L, E, and next to the, this, that plus? That plus is from box icons. And the I also, the preview, the I. You can see it's more sleek, you know? Okay. The form used to look like this. Looks a lot better now. And also created a beautiful landing page. Today you can go on form.gov.sg on your phones and you can see this landing page. And this, this was a very powerful feature that led to the recent traction because instead of trying to pass around that video, um, I mean, okay, fine, the truth is I'm lazy to make like another video, but I mean, instead of passing around that video or maybe a deck of slides to government agencies, it's better to pass then the product itself. So a landing page that describes uh, what the product is about. You know, if you scroll down, especially if you're accessing on your phones now, form.gov.sg, we put all the information there. What features do we have? How do you get started? You know, just sign up and all that. And of, of course, at the top as well, the numbers. The, and that's probably the most important part because, you know, there, there, there are many people they work with that are quite risk averse. So if no one's using it, they probably wouldn't dive in here first. So these numbers are proof that other people are already using it, which gets them started. And that's really how we are getting the recent traction because of this beautiful landing page and this, and this new refresh user experience. What's this? Oh yeah, I remember. Okay, so I think the point here is yes, that at the beginning, we were not really focused on selling that hard because we don't really want to sell a product that doesn't work. Um, you probably will probably spend a lot of time banging on doors and people will sign up, but people will probably not use your forms because it's a product that doesn't solve their problem. So at the beginning, we spent a lot of time building those features, prioritizing features, making sure it works before even getting a designer on the team to think about a better user experience, to think about a beautiful landing page. We we're not concerned with that at the beginning. At the beginning, it was all about product features. Does it solve your manual data entry problem? Does it solve your manual data entry problem? Yes, okay, we'll code that feature. And then when the time is right, which is I think a few months ago, when we wanted, when we knew that we roughly had you know, a good product that can solve you know, quite, a, quite a lot of form related problems, we can digitize paper forms, then we started uh, pushing the pedal on sales. And here's where we are, and really to be what I call future proof, we are moving away from a form builder tool as well. And so today we like to call ourselves an e-service builder, so we're more than just building a HTML form. You can also um, enable SyncPass, Mindful, and CodePass, just like that, uh, from your form. You can think of forms as basically like apps, you know, uh, at least for government, because a lot of the apps that we have are just taking in information, so they're basically forms. So if we can incorporate more of those app-like features in a form builder, we can move towards a simple app kind of builder, such as, you know, integrating with digital just e-payments and all these things. We're not there yet, but we could consider such things. And we're also thinking of a way to move away from emails, right? So one of the possible ways is end-to-end -end encryption. We can store the data, uh, but the server never sees the private key. The private key could be um, emailed to the person that's, that creates the form. And of course, once we start storing data, it opens up a whole world of opportunities where it's more convenient. Um, the script was bad, the data collection tool was a bit better, but it's still not as convenient if you see the responses there on the same site. And once we start storing these encrypted responses, um, provided the private key from the user, you can link up to you know, data analytics and visualization of results, and also to integrate directly with backend agency workflow systems. You know, all those case management systems, clients, CRMS, CMS, whatever you call it, those, they can supply the private key and they, they could fetch data from our home builder tool as well. And we are going to open source back again after doing a bit more cleanup. And the goal of that, of course, is to contribute to the open source community, but also for agencies uh, to um, perhaps get their own developers and all that to code niche features if they want to. That's how we could augment our engineering team. Uh, because, you know, there could be a certain agency such as, uh, let's say, uh, I don't know, NEA, for example, you know, they, they might need like a geofencing kind of feel or something like that. So, so, so it's a very niche, niche feature that only caters to them. So as a platform servicing so many different agencies, at this point I think over 65 different agencies, we might not necessarily want to focus on that feature. So, but they will want that feature, it might be a blocker for them. What they can do is they could 
you know, our code is open source, if you hire maybe a developer to code that specific feature and send a pull request back, and then all of a sudden this feature can be available for everyone as well, although it serves their niche need. So I think I've come to the end of the presentation, so that is all. Thank you. <coughs> Do we have time for questions? I don't know what's the... What time do you guys open? close? Um, <laughs> It's a tricky question in front of my boss at the back. Uh, uh, just kidding. <laughs> um, so I think for, for everyone's sanity, uh, I just joined my job yesterday, so I want to go home. But uh, I think normally most of them close at 9. So I hope if GovTech has no issues, maybe folks could just ask uh, Leonard any questions. Uh, mingle around to maybe 8.25, 9 ish. Yeah? Any questions? Yep. Yeah. Always ready to Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm Neil Rizwat from Germany. Okay, so my question is uh, I forgot my question for a moment. Yes. <laughs> yeah, okay, so always happens to me. So two parts, right? First question is how did you even end up working on the force? Was this like on a roadmap somewhere? Was this something that your boss has said we got to solve this problem? Or did you just have a request one day on email and decided to solve it with a script? There? And then you kind of walk into this whole thing, right? Yeah. Um, second question is, it's been, I don't know how many months, 15, 16 months or so. With the benefit of retrospect, right? And if you could reverse time, what would you have done differently, if anything? And by the way, my wife works for PA. I asked her earlier today, do you use form? Oh, she's using it. She said yes. Ah, <laughs> it's a true market test. <laughs> Okay, so um, we, we don't say how to yeah, start as well. Um, sure. So basically, <coughs> our team has had a library of ideas that we've been trying to budget over for a long time. Like we have a giant wall and post it aside of like ideas we can have. And this is one of them. The idea is that there's so many digital forms in government. What if we build a form builder? We should follow it and you're like, oh, but security, right? Security hard. How to do security? And so it's like, well, idea. Don't have a database, send it to his email. And that was pretty much like the one paragraph that you have um, When Leonard joined the team, there, there was a couple of projects. Forms was not one of them. We were working on data.gov and working on Beeline. Uh, like parking, like this, and like almost every other project we did, this was a CCA. No one told us to build it. Basically, it's like, this seems pretty neat. Leonard, you seem interested in this sort of thing. We have some cycles, but go check this out. Uh, and I told him to go work in it for a little bit. And like, he got some users. And once we got enough users, we were like, it seems like a real project, why don't we get some funding for it? And once we get some funding for it, then that's good. We had to do the thing first and then get the funding, not the other way around. No one, like, it really was just squeezed in in between other project cycles. Uh, but that's that say. Yep, yeah. I think, I, I think that's basically it. So let me answer the second question. What would I change? Probably start thinking about this end to end encryption thing a bit earlier. The whole email data collation tool thing wasn't, wasn't the most user friendly for users. You know, I, I think if you probably ask uh, people in PA, right, um, they'll probably say, oh, it's really easy to create a form, but right, people always say, listen to the thing after the but, right? Uh, and pay special attention to that. They always say, but it was so hard to collate the data back. So emails was the great hack at the beginning that got us off the ground because we, we didn't have to think about, about hosting on extensive secure government data centers. But it would probably help us if we think about the end-to-end -end encryption solution a bit earlier. Yep, what's up? When you're flying into a new country, you have to fill out a customs form. Or in Singapore, like the entry exit form. And there's still paper. Can you use the tool for that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. If you, yeah. if you, us the, if you can tell us the form and... If you, can if you have the form link or something, we could... Or in the name of the form, we could... Maybe you get on the airplane Oh, that one! I think it's the information but agency. But I think people normally fill in their form of the plane, we just know like Wi-Fi connection. Uh, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> Things to think about. Wi-Fi <laughs> <laughs> connection of the plane. <laughs> um, maybe I'll try. <laughs> yeah. That I agree. I think I think some some countries actually um, <coughs> even made that online. I think people fill it in, not on the plane. I think some countries that have been to. Sorry? Yeah. 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 Basically, uh, yes. 
there are a whole bunch of things we want to, uh, we want to digitize. Um, yeah. If we get, if if this is something that we can get to, uh, the question is just the question is just simply like a matter of if you tell us if, if there's enough uh, pressure to do so, we can do so, and if you can so, if you send us an email saying that hey, yes. I'm a yes. whatever, and I'm concerned that this is not digitized, <laughs> that actually counts for a lot. I'm not kidding. Like, email the email is very powerful. We can email circulate it. Count for a lot. Yes. Like people think that people think that like the government like. Like, I can tell you that as a government worker, our internal opinions we spend months on mean nothing. But it's <laughs> public if the citizens email, like, e email like uh, civil servants or email like ministers, to ask for things, and or we pass those emails along, things happen really quick. So yeah, if there's stuff you wanted to digitize, just email us and we'll do it. Like, it, it really helps. Hmm. So my email is Leonard at data.gov.sg. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yep. <laughs> What's the KPI on and how does the funding work? Because it cover on this for everyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, so technically, we are still a pilot project, technically. So um, KPIs are mainly defined. I mean, we, we actually define the KPIs and we discuss it with our bosses and, and they agree to it, then they give us the funding. Um, KPIs revolve around usage. Right, so the KPIs on forms created, KPIs on users sign up, and, and stuff like that. Right. So we've hit those KPIs. Um, in terms of how much we actually fund that, I'm not sure if we can actually share. Such. Uh, okay, so basically the way to think about it is that one of the one of the <coughs> weird things is that when we present these products, you know, is that like a lot of the work goes into figuring out how to make this product as small as possible. Um, for government systems, the footprint's are actually quite large. And so compared to like what government spend on very digitization systems, the amount we got spend running forms is I would say less than 0.1%. Small fraction, yeah. Um, and the reason we put this in the case is because if you think about the system, right, there's no infrastructure. Because you don't need to store any data and you just send everything through as an email. Literally you have a server which sends a form which can be basically saved cash technically. Um, so that requires almost no infrastructure. And it's passed through an email to your government email address, and then there's a solid data, so we don't have a database. So our total infrastructure cost for running this is virtually nil. Um, the main funding funding is pretty much like approval or manpower to work on this, and that's it. Uh, the I, I, I believe proportion of amount we spend on infrastructure compared to like salary of like the what three people involved on this people for this project. So, uh, I think it's like less it's than ninety to ten or something. Yeah, yeah, like yeah manpower than 90, ninety. Uh, actual uh, infrastructure so ten. Yeah. Right. That's one of the so. In the private sector, they're doing a project. Basically, you want to like hype it up and be like, "Oh, this is going to be the biggest thing that everyone's going to buy, and like it's going to be worth a billion dollars, or whatever." In the government, you're trying to be opposite. You're trying to like, like crunch it down to this like really tiny scale. Like, don't worry about this. It's just a little small project. You know what? It's not going to cost you anything. Um, and that's kind of what we're going to do. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's really okay. It doesn't cost the agencies anything because if we have to charge, if we have to like do billing for you and do cost to tell you, it just it just wastes everyone's time. Um, the whole point is that like someone can get up and set up a form in literally 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the cool demos we did was uh, so Asha I believe gave a talk at one of our conferences about form SG. And in the talk itself, he on the spot created a feedback form for the talk. Um, <coughs> live in front of everyone. The fact that it's and there's no, no overhead. And there's no like he didn't have to like prove you made money for this. And then like sort of like drove the point of how you did it. So getting that small proportion and low giving cycle is going to be quite much fun. I understand, like um, in the government agencies, there's a lot of uh, in, like not very tech literate people. Like uh, they probably have a lot of problem, like or even uh, like one of the have problem understanding what's the script. So like. Uh, because I, I, what I do is I <coughs> end customers are SMEs, so I face like a lot of problems. Like uh, all these customers, they don't know like how to even access the SaaS application. And all. Mm. Yeah. So, what are the you know like, like other than that uh, eye tracking thing that you have done? Like, is there anything else that you have done to you know like to monitor this, uh, like to improve, like to help this maybe slightly older or the yeah. in the agencies to adopt mm. your yep. application. So, 
The best way to educate and support users right now with 65 agencies is to identify ambassadors in each agency. So a lot of these are actually volunteers. So, I mean, some of them are actually, so I guess the, the way GovTech works is in this building, we have all the practitioners, we have you know, product managers, engineers, designers in this building, but a large part of GovTech is actually situated across different government agencies. For example, at MOM, we have a CIO over there and his team that uh, helps out with the IT in MOM. So what we did was actually work with people across various agencies, and they will be the ones that handhold public officers to digitize their forms. Let's say, you know, if there's a less tech-savvy public officer in these agencies, they could contact the CIO team, which will help them build Form SG forms, help them understand what the script is, and stuff like that. And in some cases, also organize workshops. You know, uh, we've organized quite a few, you know, some for MOE, some for MOM, MND, etc. What we do is that, you know, our team of, let's say, four or five will go down, you know, spend maybe four hours, and they will invite even hundreds of their public officers to come down and we will digitize the forms for them on the spot on that day as well. Yeah. Yep. Hi, my name is Julia, I'm a designer. Um, I have one question about open sourcing the project. Like, what are some thoughts behind like, open sourcing this project? And like, are there any like, special government rules? Like, if you want to decide this project, it's going to be open source, you have to like, in all the check boxes before you can open source it, or you just like with the team, like okay, let's open source it, force it to GitHub. So. I think so. <laughs> thankfully, in the government, uh, we are in a sort of weird crux here because we personally believe that this is public money and should be public. Pretty much, right? There's a lot of it's the same argument for like public funded research that should be openly published. Uh, and if we spend taxpayer money doing this, there's no reason, and we don't make profit off it, there's really no reason to not share this with people. Um, that's on soft and soft level. On a practical level, uh, we are on this nice juncture where like, our senior leadership doesn't care too much about this stuff, but they just crack a little fine as hell. So we don't have to build a tech community. So like, yeah, sure, go ahead. So we do it. Uh, that's pretty much it. There is like, there, we, are, we are sufficiently ahead of our time that there are no regulations around open sourcing things yet. So we could pretty much just see that process like, hey, we're going to open source this, is that cool? They'll look at it and be like, yep, that seems all right. And then, uh, we have dozens of things open sourced already. So we have a lot of like a lot of that we have kind of Mostly a small group um, modules and things here and there. Nothing super major just yet. Uh, but we have a few things like D-Line is partially open source forms. Form is going to be open source, parking is going to be open source. Uh, once you clean up the code a little bit. Uh, but yeah, nothing. The, the, the only, the major concern with open sourcing is that someone will uh, basically build a sort of spoof replica fishing site of your thing, uh, which should be a concern, it makes it a little bit easier. But really, if you have that kind of malicious actor, you can do that anyway because you just download the HTML. Um, yeah. So, uh, realistically, the, the risks are very low, benefits are pretty high, it brings you goodwill. Uh, contribute back to the community and if everyone starts using this thing that works a lot though. Yep. Hi, I'm Dan from the community. Kind of dated to this point, right? So I think if you're getting all the different things, it's kind of fun. And we'll build these features and then we have a lot of content that we're going to do for the loud and the game to be able to have this here. So for example, you know, if you have a product um, if people just start adding stuff to it, you know, the UX test point are used to say, hey, you know, end up being very broken because it's a whole bunch of features and people just don't want to know, they will think about the UX. Um, so if you guys think about that, it's like a process that you're going to do, it's like a technique. You're completely right. So we actually haven't thought of this process yet. So our thinking is, at least at the beginning, maybe work with a, a few agencies to figure out how this process works. Um, I was, I mean, just on the top of my head, I was thinking that um, we will we will want to conform to our design guidelines at least. Um, so it's it's either a choice between just giving the agencies, I guess, some components to work with, or letting them make the logic logic based changes, and then for us to do a bit of work to make sure it fits in with the user experience. So it could be either or. Um, perhaps tending more towards the latter, but you're right. This is a process that we still have yet to work on. Yeah. Okay. Well, last question. You guys already have to go to the Send me those paper forms. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. 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 Thank you.